This is the equation for a radar signal-to-noise ratio, or SNR, which measures how detectable your desired signal is against your system's noise. An example of this would be a single-tone signal and a noise floor under it. If the SNR is big, like we have here, it's simple to tell that there's a target, but if the SNR is reduced, it becomes harder and harder to tell if the signal is actually something interesting or just some more noise. This equation can be split into two main components, the signal and the noise. Before we get into that though, if you'd like to follow along and play with these equations yourself, check out the interactive radar cheat sheet in the description, which is a Python notebook where you can use the equations with example systems and solve challenge problems. Okay, let's start with the signal portion, which is actually the exact equation we went into in the range equation video, which gives you received power. The only difference is how this AE term, or the effective aperture, is represented. You can also say it's equal to the receive antenna gain times the wavelength squared over 4 pi. And if you sub that back into the equation, it would make both of these sides equal. But don't worry if you don't recognize this. The main point is just to know that this part of the equation is just how much power the radar receives back from the target, and I'll cover each of these components again here. This received signal power can be influenced by each of these components individually, which would in turn affect the SNR. The most straightforward way to increase SNR would probably be to increase the transmit power, because the more power you transmit, the more power will be reflected off the target, and the more power you'll receive back. But that's not always an option, because it can increase things like price, power consumption, heat dissipation, just to name a few. You could also increase the antenna gain, which is a measure of how effectively you can direct the radiated power to your target relative to the power that goes in all the other directions. And this can be done in a number of ways. In a phased array, for example, you could increase the number of elements in the array, which would give you a more directive beam and therefore more gain. But that also comes with the downside of increasing size, cost, power consumption, and even more. Now, this term here is the wavelength, and it's equal to the speed of light c over the operating frequency f, and we can change this frequency. Decreasing the frequency would reduce the amount that the signal degrades as it travels through the air, which would really help with the SNR, but unfortunately the frequency is normally set at the beginning of the design because of how much it affects. I mean, changing frequency will change your whole antenna design, which despite it looking like people just drawing funny shapes, is actually really difficult. Next is this 4 pi cubed constant, which partially comes from the equation for the surface area of a sphere, but like the speed of light, we can't manipulate this to get a better SNR, so I won't really cover it here. But if you're curious about where it comes from, check out the last video that goes into this in much more depth. Now, these last two items are the radar cross-section and the target's range, and both are related to the actual target that we're looking at. The radar cross-section is relative to how big the target is, and the range is how far away the target is. This means that depending on what and where your target is, the SNR will change. So quite a few things can be changed to help out your signal power, but they all come with different trade-offs to make depending on your application. But what about the noise? Well, this is the equation where K is the Boltzmann's constant, T is the system temperature, B is the receive bandwidth, and L is any extra losses before and in the receiver. It's a pretty simple equation, but it encompasses a lot, and it could definitely be a whole video on its own. Let's split this up even further into two components, the thermal noise, which is like the bare minimum noise floor based on temperature, and the loss term, which is kind of a catch-all for all the other losses in the system. First, we'll go into the thermal noise. Again, this K is the Boltzmann's constant, and it helps us relate the kinetic energy of the particles in our system to the system's temperature. The higher the temperature, the more the electrons move around, and the higher magnitude of voltage variations you get, which means higher noise. So you get it in terms of energy per temperature, or in units of joules per Kelvin. Since it's a constant, this value will always be about 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd. Now, a common value for this temperature would be 290 Kelvin for room temperature, but again, it's just a temperature, so it'll vary based on where you are. If you take this and multiply it by that Boltzmann's constant, these two Kelvin terms would cancel and you would just get the total energy in the system in joules. But this energy is evenly distributed across all frequencies, and it's super interesting why it's distributed in this way, but I tried to explain it concisely and my explanation and animations kept coming out to like a 
five minute tangent. So I'll just cover that in another video. So depending on how big of a bandwidth your receiver covers, we'll see differing amounts of noise. And that's where multiplying the bandwidth term comes in. If we were using a bandwidth of say 1.6 megahertz, we can multiply it by the system energy to get the total noise power due to the system's temperature. But since this is such a tiny number, we'll usually express it in dB, so we would get negative 141.9 decibels relative to one watt, or dBW. And if you're not familiar with the decibel scale, check out the Python notebook in the description where you can play around with these equations and learn about decibels. And that's the thermal noise. But once you receive the signal, it still has to go through all the receiver's electronics, which aren't perfect and will each add some noise or loss. For example, coming into the receiver, the signal might first go through a switch to choose between the transmit and receive paths. And then it could go through a power limiter to make sure not too much power is coming in which could overload your electronics. These will both add some loss, decreasing your SNR. Then it might go through an amplifier, which will amplify the signal's power, but it'll also amplify the noise surrounding it, and it'll even add some of its own noise. Because of this, we'll normally choose a low noise amplifier, or LNA, but even these add some of their own noise to the system. This system architecture can vary a lot, and will often have even more components than this, each adding their own gain or loss, and some noise. All these losses, and any losses or inefficiencies before the antenna, will combine to form that L term, and the noise will form a full receiver noise factor. The full equation for that noise factor, also called the noise figure when represented in dB, it's super important and used all the time, but I'll give a more in-depth explanation of it in the next video in this series. So now we know what all the separate components of the signal to noise ratio equation are, and we can combine them to form the whole equation. Like with the range equation in the last video, this is just a basic form of it, and it can be extended to fit many applications, of which I'll talk about some in the future videos. Now that we've gone through this explanation, you can check out the interactive radar cheat sheet in the description and try the challenge problems to solidify your knowledge. As always, there's resources, caveats, and all the source code for this video is in the description. Thank you all so much for watching, and see you in the next one!